Good evening, everyone. I'm Karen Nelson, and I'm Dean of the School of Architecture. The BAC has been recognized with distinction for its leadership role in educating an extraordinarily diverse student body to help bring about social equity through design, <laughs> through the design of landscapes, the design of interior architecture, historic preservation, designs for human health, and more. To continue and expand this work, we have built a partnership with the City of Boston and Boston Planning and Development Authority to expand our Summer Fellows Program and engage local high school students in design workshops to consider how the built environment comes together. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce the BAC's second event in the student-sponsored lecture series of Fall 2022, Just Environments. The Child's Endowed Lectureship was established to honor the memory of Morris F. Childs, a dedicated preservationist and celebrated architect who co-founded the Boston-based firm, Childs, Bertram, and Sakaris. The BAC and CBT have a long professional and personal history together. CBT co-founders, Mars Childs, Richard Bertman, and Childs, Sakaris all taught at the BAC, along with many other firm employees. CBT has employed BAC students and alumni, some of whom are here with us this evening. And I just want to give you a sense of Morris Child's beautiful hand in sketching. One of the things we look for in a child's lecture is someone who thinks about design and also challenges us to think about it differently through representation. This endowed lectureship was created to honor Maury Child's commitment to design education and his lifelong contributions to the BAC and its students in perpetuity. Tonight's lecturer, Patty Anna Horry, is the seventh to have this honor. And I want to just give you a sense of who else. So there's a beautiful watercolor by Maury, a beautiful interior by CBT. Um, here they are in 1989 on the Prudential Center redevelopment. They reached their 50 year anniversary in 2017. Our first Child's Memorial Lecture was Blair Kamen, architecture critic of the Chicago Tribune, Tom Maine in 2017. Uh, Merrill Elam and Max Scoggin, then Craig Scott of Iwamoto Scott, who actually were part of Patty and Ahori's thesis panel, <coughs> Juan Miro, based in Texas, Young Ho Chang, and now Patty and Ahori. So I want to tell you a little bit about Patty. Whoops, I wasn't, that's what I wanted to keep up. Um, Patty and Ahori is an architect working across building, art, pedagogy, and curatorial practices. Her interests center on interrogating the politics and narratives of identity and belonging across spatial practices and articulation with geopolitics, memory, race, and gender constructs from an African island perspective. Anna Hori co-founded Storia Na Lugar, a storytelling and counter-narrative platform exhibited at the International Architectural Exhibition at the Venice Biennale in 2021. She is co-curator of Her Here Otherwise, an experimental platform that invites African and diaspora women architects to interrogate notions of representation and belonging. She served as co-founding director of SIDLAT, a research center at the University of Cabo Verde, she is a member of the Board of Academic Advisors at the African Futures Institute, a Ghanaian School of Architecture with Leslie Loco. She co-authored the forthcoming book, Panorama de, oh, I'm gonna slaughter this, sorry, Arquitectura Habitacional in Cabo Verde, Panorama of Dwelling Architecture in Cabo Verde, and her work is featured in The New Curator, Exhibiting Architecture and Design. You can see this in our library if you go upstairs tonight. Her work also appears in the Faden Atlas of 21st Century Contemporary World Architecture and in the forthcoming Bloomsbury Global Encyclopedia of Women in Architecture, 1960 to 2015, and a Reba publication looking at women architects across the globe. This year, Anna Hori is a member of a collective awarded a Graham Foundation grant in 2000, she won the Roach Traveling Scholarship Competition, becoming the first Black person and only the second woman to receive the prize since its establishment in 1883. She holds a Master of Architecture degree from Princeton University and a Bachelor of Architecture degree from the BAC. Her undergraduate thesis, which you can also see in the library, holds many narratives about women and space, 
and how correctional facilities often ignore female narratives by construction. Please give a warm welcome to Child Moore Electric. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm a little bit emotional. Um, sorry. It's been 27 years. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. <laughs> well, this is the first. <laughs> uh, it's been 27 years since I graduated from the Boston Architectural Center, then called Boston Architectural Center, today called Boston Architectural College. Um, it's been a long time since I returned here, and this was a very special place for me. I also had the pleasure of teaching here uh, 26 years ago, so it was the first time I was teaching, and I taught first year design studio and also uh, thesis uh, design studio. So uh, I apologize if I'm a little bit emotional, but um, 27 years is a long time, and um, I'm grateful for, for this invitation uh, from Dean Karen Nelson and from the Board of Directors of the BAC. And I also thank the Maurice uh, Child Memorial Lectureship for uh, making my uh, presence here today possible. I hope it's the first of, of many uh, now that so much time has passed. So today I'm going to share with you a very personal journey uh, and one that was kind of uh, catapulted from the BAC. We're having... And I invite you to think with me uh, this past 27 years. Uh, it was a very hard to, um, it was very hard to edit so much from 27 years ago. And I also, I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful and interested uh, in part of the just lecture series, which I just saw outside the elevator door. Technical difficulties as yeah okay so um, I titled the lecture errant praxis um, practicing architecture otherwise and I'll explain because I use my slides almost like a a thinking a sketchbook a thinking a way to to think through my ideas and to present them to you i don't read much i'm going to try to say a few things that i have written here but it's really um i use these opportunities to think through some ideas also and put something forward so errant practice is a way that i've um have framed my practice uh for the past many uh, decades or a few decades and um it's a framework that I will explain. Uh, oops. Where do I point? Oh, okay. Can we do this? Because sorry, it's not. No. We're gonna click on this. And then... Any go there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why do I title my practice Erin? I actually, um, I, and you, you will see after I present a few more slides, but I will read through it, although it's here. The errant is that which is trained from the accepted course of standards. On the one side, did some research on its etymology, translations, and uses. The word sets in motion the expansive possibilities of its use, referring to journeys outside set paths. It connotes wanderings, migration, nomadic uh, experiences, a spatial temporal condition connecting diverse geographies of memory across different places and time. It's an embodied and embedded experience, which also brings to the fore the politics of bodies in motion, therefore the politics of territory, 
something that interests me along my work. So I also did this diagram, which um, you don't have to understand it, but it's it's very much about rerouting and returning. And this trip for me back to to the BAC is one that has uh, a lot of connotations with uh, returns and um, uh, and finding of roots and roots. Um, oops. So, um, hmm, okay, I'll, I'll skip this one. <laughs> um, so I, I, this is kind of an index, but also a, a way to begin to explain a little bit how I'm, I'm thinking about this, this talk. And a lot of it from the BAC from 27 years ago uh, has been kind of a research uh, for ground, and I'll explain that, and many returns, and I've labeled them return one to three, and then some grounding in interventions, which is when I went back to Cabo Verde, which is where I'm from, and I've been uh, practicing for the past uh, 14 years, and then building platforms, which is um, some of the work that I do in creating spaces um, beyond uh, the physical space, uh, spaces of representation across my curatorial work, and then resetting frameworks, which is about uh, rethinking paradigms and breaking through the canons of architecture to include uh, other knowledge systems. So the first one is researching for ground and my first return. And I here put the BAC, which is a very important moment. I was very fortunate to be, have been awarded at the BAC the Ames Traveling uh, Scholarship in 1995 um, when I graduated. Actually, I think it was 94 and then I, I oh, I'm okay. good, 95 when I graduated. Um, and it was a very special, um, end to my time here at the BUC and the BUC at the time, I don't know how it is now, I look forward to learning more about it, but the BUC at the time was a very special place for me and for many other of my colleagues because it, um, it allowed us some flexibility to, to craft our own education. I think that that was a, a blessing and quite a, an incredible opportunity for me and my colleagues at the time to take advantage of. And um, and once I won the, the Ames Traveling Fellowship here, uh, my graduating year, I traveled to South Africa, uh, Swaziland, uh, now Estawini, and uh, Zimbabwe. And for me, it was uh, very important, especially with my thesis, which uh, Dean Karen Nelson mentioned, I started to think about the politics of architecture and the politics of um, space and the control of bodies and female bodies and that's why uh, my thesis was a woman's prison to kind of uh, investigate and question and subvert um, and explore uh, the idea that architecture is also about control and so this was my first kind of search and journey into expanding my architectural education um, beyond the canons of architecture. We're talking about 27 years ago, and I had the pleasure of sitting in on your previous class, and you're beginning to see architects, and you're beginning to see architecture pro uh, projects across the globe, which is something I did not have uh, during my, my education. Um, and for me, um, the fellowship allowed me to search for, for new ground, to include my spatialities, to include uh, erased um, magnificence, especially of the African continent, which is where I'm from. Um, and so this was a very important moment to kind of ca catapult me into questioning uh, the canons of architecture pedagogy and also of architecture practice. So I had the pleasure of going to the Great Walls of, uh, of Zimbabwe in Mashvingo, in Zimbabwe, uh, see the work of Ndebele women in South Africa, and also to understand post-apartheid uh, space. Uh, it was right after liberation in South Africa from the apartheid system. So at that moment, I was already very much uh, interested in, in expanding and thinking through ideas of uh, the role of architecture and what architecture does and has done in the legacies of it, especially coming from a, a continent and a country that had been colonized. 
but whose uh, but the production of uh, our, our spatial production was not taken into consideration. <coughs> I then went to Princeton, as, as uh, Karen also mentioned, and I continued my research and continuing this kind of search for um, architecture and the politics of space, uh, the control of bodies, um, and throughout a, a few of my work there. And my thesis at, uh, at Princeton um, had to do with the homing landscapes and memorials and mapping memory, and had to do also with questioning um, these absences. I'm, I'm okay, but I'm watching a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hi, whoever's on Zoom, if they could turn. Well, I don't know, you know, a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's a lot of excitement in this. Uh, can can someone, uh, whoever's on Zoom, can they mute their their mics? Uh, Oh, okay. Hmm. Now, the, there are two moments that I would like to mark. I mean, of course, I marked the BAC as a, a very important moment in my life, and not just because I'm here, but it really, really was. Uh, it started this kind of journey uh, of, of questioning and returning, but also because until then, uh, as I mentioned before, um, discussions on identity, race, politics, uh, Africa, and other geographies were not included on the canon. But something, ha something happened in 2000. <laughs> um, and, if, and there were a few very interesting and powerful scholars um, like Leslie Local, um, Craig Barton, who were publishing very interesting uh, projects. But what really legitimized the insertion of African landscapes and African um, practices uh, was Rem Koolhaas's um, Harvard project on the city uh, from a very problematic perspective, if you ask me. But uh, then it became very legitimate to consider uh, and to include um, Africa, Africa's, let's say, uh, into the discourse of architecture. And this is after um, a few years of me trying to um, legitimize these sites as sites of, of, of inquiry and sites of, of legitimate um, contribution for the architecture canon. So that changed. Um, so my third return, as I call it, um, happened when I participated in the Roach Traveling Fellowship. Um, scholarship, uh, I should say, and the project for the first time also um, had to do, we had to design uh, a museum for the Underground Railroad. I don't know if any of you have uh, participated in the Roach, it's a very intensive uh, two-phase competition, 
the first phase is uh, 48 hours. So we get the program on a Friday and we uh, return the boards on a Monday morning. So we don't sleep for 48 hours. And um, uh, and I was uh, I was uh, very fortunate to be given such a challenging all of us to be given such a challenging program, which was the design of uh, for the Underground Railroad. Um, and for me, it was also quite powerful to 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 take on that challenge. And uh, my design had a lot to do with the lexicon of the of the quilts from the African American tradition. Uh, and the quilts were used as uh, markers along the, the the Underground Railroad to signal safe spaces for for the enslaved people to 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 receive or be, be hosted during their their uh, crossing to the north to the free north. Uh, I also had already, as I mentioned, been thinking about. Um, um the black body as as a site of, of of inquiry also and was very much inspired by the work of photographer lorna simpson and the museum became um, its own language and became kind of a fragmented non-centralized uh non-hierarchical um experimentation of um of museum as went dug up some of the drawings. <laughs> oh, there was some for a long time ago, but just some plans and um, I figured, you know, I'd revisit this um, and remember those those moments. Um, so um, I won't go into the detail of the design, but it was also a moment to experiment with a lot of the ideas of how to, again, break through the canons and begin to question the role of, of museums um, in the retelling of, of history and their role in, in the erasure of other histories and how this museum could possibly be more connected to the city and it networked to other spaces. So I won. <laughs> <laughs> I won in, in 2000. It was very symbolic, um, the turn of the, um, of the millennium, but also a moment where um, as I mentioned, there was a beginning of a crack as to considering other geographies and other possibilities of, of inquiry into architecture. Um, it was a, 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 an incredible recognition uh, of the work. And I'm happy to say that it was a um, anonymous competition. Uh, so the first phase is anonymous. Um, uh, after you submit, after the 48 hours of not sleeping, you submit it, and uh, about 10 days later or two weeks later, uh, the six finalists are revealed. Uh, at that moment, then it's no longer anonymous. Um, and then you have another two weeks uh, for f to develop the project. In this case, it was the same project, but usually it changes. And through a process of interviews and presenting your work, um, you're awarded on the same day that you are interviewed. So that was a, another very special moment for me uh, and another opportunity for me to continue to pursue my, 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 my research on what it means to practice uh, architecture. So um, it was not, um, it was, um, <laughs> let me go back to the slide. It was a moment also of our, our resistances because it was the first time that um, a Roach uh, winner in 117 years was proposing traveling to um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And, um, and um, uh, <laughs> my proposal was met with some skepticism, which must be shared here, not as a, a complaint, but just to, to kind of highlight uh, the moment that we were living at the time. And that's very important to share here because um, there was a, a lot of surprise. Why would I want to go travel for a year on the continent of Africa? Uh, was I not going to Italy and Greece? Um, would I not even consider maybe Japan? Um, and was I interested in um, vernacular architecture from Africa? So as you can imagine, uh, today I could break those down uh, um, 
into how problematic they were, and they felt very problematic to me also. But um, I had one, <laughs> and it was based on my competition and not on my my proposal for travel. Um, so for me, uh, since I was um, confronted with the idea of why was I not going to Greece and why was I not going to the classical kind of foundations of architecture, when I came back and had to give a talk, I, I actually called it rerouting and rerouting the Ar architectural grand tour. And I'm sure you're all very familiar with the grand tour um, as a kind of male practice of, <laughs> you know, um, of some centuries ago with acquiring knowledge by traveling in Europe. Um, so for me, I, I traveled extensively throughout um, West Africa and um, East Africa uh, for about a year. Um, and for me, it was again about searching and complicating these grounds of research. Um, and here, I also kind of broke through the the the, uh, the kind of uh, naming of countries and kind of looked at conditions and, and understanding of spatialities and, and how we um, can expand our understanding of what architecture is by different practices of architecture or different spatial practices that are not just about the architect and the architect as visionary, the architect as uh, the maker of um, buildings. And I traveled along the Niger River, uh, crossing many countries along West Africa. Um, and this is a, a picture in Dakar, Senegal, and it's very meaningful to me because on Fridays uh, at 2 p.m., the streets are occupied completely uh, by prayer. And then five minutes later, you know, the cars return. And it's a very kind of poignant moment where everything stops and the kind of the, 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 your, your spatial experience of this uh, city transforms. Uh, and it's also kind of a subversion to the, the French planning system, which was the gridded system, as you can see a little bit on the corner over there. And coincidentally, the grid faces east. So when you're when you're praying to Mecca, you're kind of uh, occupying this imposed grid uh, of the French colonial um, uh, city planning. And I thought it was kind of a very interesting reversal of, of or, or complementing or at least kind of confrontation uh, with these planning legacies uh, um, in Africa and elsewhere. And I also began to think of um, other conditions, um, landscape conditions, and I traveled along the Niger River that is not only <laughs> it's not only a, a a river it's 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 a, a boundary it's a place it's a connector it's a route as most rivers are and um it has such an incredible history and so i took the niger all the way to timbuktu um and for me uh, you know when when i'm asked you know if, if i was to answer um, to the roach uh, committee at the time i would say that you know one needs to expand our understanding of who makes architecture and what is spatial um our spatial relationship to place and our understanding of belonging uh, which is very powerful so for me this journey on the river um was life-changing mm. just some images from my sketchbook and um kind of an understanding of of um the different uses and the different um, um, the way architecture uh, complements uh, a, a way of life instead of necessarily imposing on one. I also had an incredible um, um, I don't even want to call it luck, but this amazing experience of going to Lalibela in Ethiopia. I went to many other countries, but I'm just showing you a few. Um, and Lalibela, and this is the ancient cities of Lalibela with the rock hewn um, churches. Uh, this is Beta Giorgis. Um, it was an incredible experience. I was in the market, it was market day. Market day on the West African continent and the East African continent is a big day. And on the landscape, which you could see is kind of these rolling hills of red and earth, I saw, suddenly I saw. Uh, a horizon, a very straight, you know, architectural line, just peeking through these rolling hills. And 
it was just incredible. It was calling on me. And when I arrived here, this is a picture I took. Actually, it's not a picture, it's filmed. That's why it's such poor quality. I was just fascinated by this 11th century uh, architecture, but I couldn't find a way to, to go down. It was quite, really quite incredible. How do I go down the, the, four, the three stories or four stories? And it's this really very, oh, I don't, I can't believe I don't have the picture. I'm, I'm sorry. But you, the ground almost kind of is carved and opens up and it's a little path that you begin to lose your horizon and then you kind of arrive and suddenly uh, you're looking up at where you were, as you can see the people there. Um, so these are incredible um, masterpieces of architecture that never were not part of my architectural training. And I must say, before I came to the BAC, I went to Pratt for three and a half years and then whatever, how many years I was here. And I never, ever, 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 ever um, even uh, had any reference to, to, to these architecture. So here's a, a section through some of these churches that kind of negotiate ground in such a powerful way. Um, so again, uh, continue with this uh, idea of returns and turning around and repositioning myself in reference to the canons and finding kind of my ground. Uh, I went back to Cabo Verde, as I mentioned, um, about 14 years ago, and also had to confront other, other uh, paradigms and had to kind of confront what is my role as an architect uh, at the University of Cape Verde where um, it was our first public university in Cabo Verde. Uh, so it started about uh, 14 years ago. Um, and the, I was invited to be the director of a research center that they were um, starting up. And confronted with uh, what, a, what is the agenda for a new research center in a post-colonial um, African country of Cape Verde, and what paradigms are we going to to think, uh, to help us think through our current condition. Um, so it was an incredible experience to, to think about the, the legacy of even architecture education, and not only because we don't have, actually, let me rephrase, we don't have architecture at the University of Cape Verde. So the research center is a multidisciplinary research center to think the territory, you know, to think, to think our you know, our condition um, uh, as a developing country, as a poor country also um, on the west coast of Africa and and what what the, the dynamics of, of rapid urban growth, um, you know, um, what, what uh, the developed paradigms that we are imposed uh, from our, our, let's say, ideas of development. So there's a lot to think through. And it was a very important moment also because we begin to question um, how can we begin to create a, a space for critical thinking about our own condition. Um, so a lot of a, a lot of lectures, a lot about you know uh, cities in the global south, about looking at paradigms that could shift uh, our imported. Um, thinking, because a lot of what happens is also we import a lot of the paradigms if you don't question them. Um, and, and so it was very much about, it was a very special moment also in thinking through uh, from, a, from that perspective. This is a book that Karen uh, mentioned that we we're putting out very soon, but it was, it was a moment also of valorizing our knowledge system and of informing public policy. So we did a research on housing, not housing, on dwelling in Cabo Verde and our practices of dwelling in order to inform public policy. I'm going very fast because I don't know, I don't think I have much time. But at the same time, it's always like, I think it's my way of, of working. At the same time that I was at university, I also began to think that the university has its tempo and has its time and research takes a long time. And I also felt the need that there were urgencies in, in my country that I wanted to, to confront. Um, and one of them was the, uh, actually now I have to switch, excuse me, I'm gonna stop thinking for a minute. Where do I go? That video. 
So the same, my same colleagues that we were at the research center, we par in parallel, we created kind of an art collective uh, that wanted to address um, a lot of the narratives about um, climate change. Um, I can't think and look, obviously. <laughs> Uh, this was this was a platform online. So this was a. Oh, is it that one? It's on the, yeah, I'm trying to find it. It's on, okay. I'm just gonna let you play it. Okay. okay. Press play. So this was a platform online. I just did a video of it uh, to show you, and we were answering to a call uh, of COP11 um, for uh, African artists to uh, speak about climate change on the continent. Uh, to be shown at the COP in Cancun the year before the United Nations uh, Commission for Climate Change. And um, we submitted this kind of multimedia, um, multimedia, let's call it, uh, narrative that uh, problematized a little bit of the, the conditions that we suffer in Cape Verde. And there were four issues. One, our lack of water, which is a serious condition because we are a very arid country. Uh, we suffered from a drought from, for three years very recently. Um, and um, the labor that's involved on a daily basis for, for, for young girls and women to, to fetch water was something that we wanted to address. So here's uh, one of the uh, one of the residents of a neighborhood that we worked with, she was talking about um, how how she spends a certain amount of time fetching water every day. Um, you can see a little bit of our landscape in Cabo Verde, the, the very arid, and how water becomes such a uh, an important um, part of life and such a struggle. The other narrative was a narrative that um, uh, the poor population. Uh, extracts sand from our beaches for construction. And we were trying to kind of problematize that a little bit more also in terms of this kind of blaming of uh, a certain um, uh, sector of the society for environmental degradation when uh, our paradigms of development are so um, tied up to construction and to tourism. Uh, and the, the last one I think here, they're, they're going, it's about tourism and uh, the kind of, uh, um, how can I say? It's about tourism in some of our islands and the impact, environmental impact that that has. So we, we, were, we were kind of creating our own uh, counter narratives to the official narratives of, of blaming the population and giving voice to, to the complexities uh, of a society that's increasingly um, more segregated. Um, and also uh, reproducing a lot of the paradigms that are, that are that are played out. So this was kind of parallel to to my my job at the university as director of the research center. I felt that there was we the, the language of uh, let's call it the art language, the multimedia language, was something that was helping us address um, some of the concerns that, that were important to us. Um, I, I'm gonna stop it it's going to go on it's it was interactive and and it was a way to 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 highlight a lot of the also the gendered uh, labor issues and 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 the, and the young girls that were uh, also um uh, played a role in in the construction industry i think i go back can you help me go back PowerPoint or the, the PowerPoint. Sure. I think this is where you left off. Mm -hmm. And it's shared. Oh, it's shared. Yeah. yeah, Zoom is very good and very important, but <laughs> <laughs> it also is um, has its challenges. I'm very happy all of you who are joining from Zoom. Happy to have you. And I see a couple of friends from Cabo Verde and friends from the BAC. Mm -hmm. 
Do I get extra minutes for this? <laughs> okay, I know I don't have much more time because I actually wanted to make this a conversation. Uh, so I'm going to go really quickly through whatever slides I have left. Um, but in this, in this, um, this kind of need to 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 also confront uh, these narratives that were kind of closing us in, uh, both architecturally and also uh, socially uh, back home, um, this was the first kind of experiment in in a collective art practice, but also uh, in creating a space at my office and my partner's office for critical engagement with with issues that we felt were important. So I feel that I'm always kind of working through and, and countering the very kind of, uh, in conversation, but also in, in, in contestation uh, with a lot of the official narratives and institutions that kind of perpetuate these narratives. Um, and this is a very special project called Storia no Lugar, uh, I would translate it ungrounding narratives. Um, where my partner and I, he's a filmmaker and a, a video artist and I'm an architect. And we wanted to, again, in following up on, on my experience at the university, was to, to, to really tackle and, and connect more closely to communities that were being marginalized in our small cities. Uh, and we worked with children and, and this is our platform, storytelling counter platform counter narrative platform, Storia del Lugar. Um, and this is a little bit about us. And our first, um, there's actually a way you can go to our website. Um, and, and the projects that we were doing and we did a, um, oh, now I got, went to the, I shouldn't have gone to the website. Now I can't go back. But we, we treat, <laughs> we treat each one of these as kind of case stories. Um, that deal with the dynamics of, of um... okay, now, I'm... okay, I'm here. Yes, I did it. I'm not going to go in it. I think we have very little time. I want to open the discussion. But again, this kind of parallel work uh, on, on, on con you know, thinking of what my role is as an architect and to think through uh, spatial conditions uh, across social and political um, understandings. Uh, now, this is the project at the Biennale. I'm going to go really, really quickly um, through it. But Cabo Verde, are, uh, we are 10 islands, nine inhabited. Uh, as I mentioned before, water is a, a big concern for us. It's very arid landscape. But three of our islands are being developed or have been developed as kind of the tourism, the backbone of our economy. And we have a, a great deal of reliance on that tourism. And of course, beautiful, immense blue oceans. Uh, but very arid landscape, and this is the island of Boa Vista, and of course the, our, 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 you know, big concern with water and our, our big um, lack of water um, uh, for to sustain uh, uh, life and to sustain our, our daily existence, and that affects, of course, mostly um, the populations that are. are um, uh, financially disadvantaged. So for us, when we were invited to the, the Biennale, we made it into a case story, one more case story. Uh, and we wanted to work with these resorts <laughs> that have extensive pools of water. They look small, but that's because it, it's a very, it's a drone photo from very far away, but that drew, roll out these immense pools of, of of water and, and play on this narrative of a country, uh, a marine country full of uh, beautiful blue water and pools. But that, and then the infrastructure, so it's kind of a critique, as, as I told you, we, we do these kind of counter narratives. The infrastructure is all kind of made for these future resorts, as you can see, asphalted roads and already um, a roundabout for a possible future. Uh, resort when the majority of the population is still struggling with infrastructure, uh, access to infrastructure. Again, the very arid landscape and then the extensive pools of water. Um, so for us also the participation of the Biennale, those are uh, spaces of um, 
recognition, validity, uh, <laughs> valorization, but also very difficult spaces to, to participate in that discourse. Um, and our installation used the water bottle as kind of the cipher and the, the unit of value to begin to question landscapes and problematize uh, the idea of this uh, this blue blue uh, country that offers so much blue for consumption. Um, so we had uh, some uh, a very large installation of uh, almost a thousand water bottles uh, hung from fishing line. Mm -hmm. Uh, and everything was was recycled in recyclables, which was very important to us with our participation that we would not uh, contribute uh, even more to 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 an impact um, from the from the garbage of our installation. Um, so some photos. Um, so I think I'll wrap up because time is going right. Um, I'm not going to show you this project, but it's another one that I did an installation in a, a prison camp in Cape Verde. Um, very briefly, also in this narratives of m memory and memorializing, we were kind of ignoring a lot of the population that had occupied uh, most of the grounds of the administrative, um, the administrative grounds of the of the former prison. Um, um, so it was more working with the community and working with the children again to 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 retell the story and to incorporate them in this memory making of this museum. Um, so uh, I, uh, again, working with the children and and contesting a little bit of of the invisibilization that they were uh, going through by um, by the new project for for turning the space into a museum. I think I'll, I'll leave it here with some projects and I'll open up for discussion. Thank you very much. I know some students have to get to their class, so we we'll leave very quickly to go to class. We're staying for a question. We'd love to have questions from the audience. If you have questions, raise your hand and I'll ask. That's me. Oh, thank you. Let's go. DeAndre, is that a question? Yes, it is. Before any of these folks. <laughs> no, 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 we're still in the election. We're both in the same So have a seat. That's fine. Real quick. Yeah, yeah. No, it's like the three seconds. I just want to know what the test Sorry, folks, on the um, Zoom. Uh, I, I'll, it's not upstairs. That oh, one is coming out. out. I'll share it. It's going to be digital. So I'll send it to Karen. She'll share it. It will be open. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Wow, the students all left. I should have stopped ten minutes no, ago. No, no, it's okay. I would have loved to have them in conversation. Love to, you got some great comments in the chat. Oh, there great! Any questions among the, the students who are able to stay? <laughs> Peter, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, beautiful presentation. I just wanted to ask you. May I repeat that question? Uh, we have a question from the audience uh, commending the sectional drawings that Patty did and specifically talking about the installation in Venice. Uh, and wondering how section is part of your process or those drawings. Oh, thank you. Actually, that's a very important question because um, I didn't get to say it, but now uh, after receiving the wonderful invitation from Karen, I also received an invitation to teach at Columbia this year. So I'm visiting professor there. And it's interesting. I just wanted to fold that in because um, I'm, I'm having the students think of section and section 
beyond the kind of just architectural section and finding your ground, right? Because I mean, the section is very much about relationships and I do work a lot in section if you see uh, my thesis project from, from, from 27 years ago, a section is very important because I think it reveals a lot and establishes relationships or kind of problematizes them. So definitely uh, I'm more of a sectional thinker. I mean, a plan is a section as we know, but section for me is, is a mode of inquiry and, and it, it cuts across, I mean, uh, excuse the pun, it cuts across many issues. And then once you establish your ground, which it could, could be, what is your ground? Then you could begin to unfold what, what the question is and what your inquiry is. I hope I answered it. Mm -hmm. Good questions. Yes. Yes, and thank you so much. This is spectacular. <laughs> um, my question really is about your uh, experience in uh, in Africa mm -hmm. and coming from an island. Like it mm -hmm. feels so different to have chosen to go to this enormous place when your life really is on this. I, and I'm just curious about the differences that you've learned about where you live now since your trip through Africa. So the question is, since Patty is from an island, how different it was to explore the vast continent of Africa from an island perspective and feeling you know, the difference between those two scales. Um, Actually, the first drawing that I showed, which I didn't explain, uh, is a little bit of a, a very personal drawing because I was born on a ship. And so when I speak of horizon and ground, they, they are very much embodied questions for me. Um, and for me, as it's uh, thinking the world from an African island perspective. It's really about um, breaking through those scalar um, differences really, because I think ultimately it's not about the scale, because I mean, if you think about the population of Cape Verde, we're 500,000 in Cape Verde. We have a large diaspora, including in Massachusetts. Shout out to my people here. Um, uh, but um, it's, um, it's when we, to me, it's more about Thinking the world from an African island perspective is to understand that space and the, the dynamics cut across geopolitics, regardless of how small or how large your context is. And one of the things that we confronted a lot in, the, in our research center is that we were in a dialogue with a lot of our scholars and colleagues thinking, you know, Lagos, which is, you know, 20 million or more. Um, our biggest city is 150,000. But the dynamics are the same, right? The issues are the same across the board. The particularities, of course, are to be taken into consideration. But it's not a, it's not a, a comparative. Uh, it, 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 it's not that, it's not that f different, right? I think that for me. Uh, the horizon is very important, and I talk about it here. I, I don't talk about it, I think through it. For us as islands, the horizon is both a space of possibility, and especially as a as a, a country with a large diaspora, the horizon has a lot of meaning for us uh, as both a kind of entrapment, but also as possibility. So it's always this kind of dual, dual that's my interpretation. It, it, ha it holds possibility. Of, of, of leaving and returning because um, um, it's very much about leaving but also returning. So traveling, yes, I mean, I do, uh, I remember when I travel and I traveled a lot by land when I went to West Africa, I traveled for like from Niger to Benin to Togo to, to Ghana to Burkina Faso to Senegal. Uh, to Mali, all by land, and yes, it's 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 it's, it's very humbling to be in such a, a, a dramatic and incredible expanse of continent. Um, but I also consider our islands part of it, and I think that when I speak about Africa, I always call it African the continent, its islands, its diaspora, and its imaginaries. So to me, it's it's much it's much greater than its continental shell. So yes, it 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 was. A, 
incredible to be on the river for two days to reach Timbuktu, or more than two days. Yeah. All right, we need one more question before we go down for a session. Yeah, Asha, a student. Uh, <laughs> Hi. Uh, I have a scholarly board international. You're an international. Uh, the question is, uh, Hashem thinks Patty Anamari was an international student when? When I was here. Uh, yeah. um, well, um, <laughs> yes, no. Uh, I'm. I was an immigrant student. Let's put it that way. Because my parents had, my grandparents had immigrated, and I came to the U.S. in '86. Okay, so my main question is, how did you take the things that you learned from the BAC and the other schools where you graduated, and implement them in those in the countries you worked at? So the, the question is, how did Patty take what she learned from Pratt, the BAC, and Princeton, and implement those in the countries where she has been working? Well, I think that what I wanted to reflect here with you uh, in this talk is that it's been a continual search for uh, understanding what I learned, questioning what I learned, what its absences were, how it could be expanded. Um, so to me, it's been since the day I graduated and I received the, a the AIMS uh, a scholarship here at the BAC has been what more can I learn about architecture and what has not been been taught to me and how can I uh, how can I build a practice and you can see my practice I, of course I also have a commercial practice I do buildings but I, I I almost never show them because it's so much about expanding what an architect means and how do we understand the world and condition and this you know social injustice and environmental injustice and um, paradigms and pedagogical injustice and epistemological injustice so to me it's been more of a question of how do we confront those and it comes down to yes we we all gain tools and can the tools um you know i i will i will paraphrase audrey lord can the master's tools um dismantle the master's house because of course we have to understand that the architecture discipline is a discipline that has a, a colonial uh, racist um, uh, as a discipline, let's say, of course, architecture has been made in the world for for millennia, but as a discipline, it, it, it came about uh, during a very, a very specific time period uh, in Europe and it's very Eurocentric. So, of course, we continue to use the tools and yes, they are fantastic to a certain degree, but it is a moment to understand what they do, what they have done. So it's a continual discussion. I mean, I go back and I went back to the university and I had to say, you know, how can we even understand our cities from this kind of paradigm of European cities? No, we cannot judge our cities the same way. There are other ways of thinking spatiality and there are other ways of thinking space. And what are the paradigms that we're gonna to use to even interpret our 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 condition right uh, and this but it's always in dialogue and i think that one of the things that i wanted to finish this talk with was it's interesting because i've been always questioning this decentering and questioning the paradigms and whether institutional and at the same time now i'm back to the same and trying to insert questions and issues that i find that are important for the architecture discourse um, and contribute to the architecture discourse, whether I'm thinking it from an island perspective, or African perspective, you know, all of this part. And in some ways, we're in a very important moment also, because now the next Biennale is curated by Leslie Loco, the first African uh, to curate the architecture Biennale in Venice. And the title of the Venice Biennale next year is Laboratory for the Future, but it actually starts before it says Africa is the laboratory for the future. So I think we are coming full circle in how to insert a lot of these issues into the discourse and how to confront, you know, what we've learned and what they, how that, uh, it's a confrontation in the conversation. I, I use it as a conversation and confrontation. So you go back and you have to confront those, those issues. But I think I started much earlier here at the BAC. <laughs>